Innovative Financial Strategies for Stormwater Green Infrastructure. My name is Gwen Irwin, and first I'll go through some of the basic functions of the webinar software. If you look to the left of your desktop for the control panel, you see that there's a red arrow on the top, and that, that will expand and minimize the panel. If you plan to hear the presentation using your computer speakers, check Use Mic and Speakers in the audio pane of your control panel. If you are using your phone, check Use Telephone and enter your audio pin. If you did not receive an audio pin, there is one in your audio pane to the right of your screen. For use in a Wi-Fi connection, turn off your cell phone completely to avoid interference with the presentation. And for technical difficulties, please click on the Help at the top of the control panel to access online help. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please type it in the questions box of your screen and hit Send. We will be collecting these questions throughout the presentation and answering them either at the end of the section or at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is scheduled to run for one hour. Links to the webinar recording will be emailed to you this afternoon and will also be on the webinar page of the SESWA website. Today's webinar will examine different approaches to incorporate financial incentives into your stormwater management plan, including focusing on the perspective of a private commercial entity weighing its options as it seeks to mitigate the effects of stormwater on its property. It will review the key ingredients necessary to develop successful incentive programs in your city or county. We appreciate your join us, joining us and hope that you find today's webinar a valuable use of your time. Before we get started, I'd like to um, have, have a couple of announcements. Um, we have the annual conference coming up um, October 8th through 10th in Charleston, South Carolina. Be sure to register early. Last couple of years, we have sold out. And then I'd like to thank our sponsors, the City of Stewart, the Sailfish Capital of the World in Florida, and Sanitation District Number 1 in Kentucky. We appreciate their strong support of CESWA and its services. There is one more webinar scheduled for this year. Be sure to call us if your company or your city or county is interested in sponsorship. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters. Jeff Hughes is the Director of Environmental Finance Center at UNC. Jeff works with local governments, not-for-profit organizations, and private companies to identify and implement innovative methods of financing and maintaining environmental facilities and programs. Jeff has a Master's in Water Resources Engineering from the School of Public Health, UNC at Chapel Hill, and an undergraduate engineering degree from Duke University. Jeff served as Chatham County Public Works and Utility Director between 1996 and 1999. He has worked extensively overseas and as, as an Environmental Finance Specialist with the Research Triangle Institute. Stacy Isaac Brazer is a Senior Project Director with the Environmental Finance Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and works from a satellite office in Georgia. Stacy provides outreach services to local communities and disseminates tools and resources on topics such as funding strategies for stormwater management, rate setting practices, and general innovative financing techniques to improve water quality. She earned her master's degree in public administration at UNC Chapel Hill and her undergraduate degree at NC Central University in Environmental Services. And now I'd like to um, give the floor to Stacy. Stacy, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Gwen. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the webinar today. Um, so as Gwen mentioned, even though we wanted to keep the title, the official title of the webinar, um, to a manageable length, uh, this really is focused on private property. So there, is a, there are a host of things that you can do um, on your own government property, those of you who are joining us from stormwater utilities today. But we want to really emphasize in this webinar um, getting private owners to take Stacey, on these sort of... Let me interrupt one time. Um, I sure. passed the presentation to Jeff. Jeff, are you, do you have that? Yes, we're pulling it up right now. Okay. Okay, so we're still Stacey, on the just go without the slides for now. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I'm on the first slide, and the, I was just mentioning that the title that we have today officially is Innovative Financial Strategies for Stormwater Green Infrastructure, but the emphasis is going to be on private, um, private property. Um, you guys have 
sort of license to do a lot of cool uh, stormwater green infrastructure projects on your own government or public property, but the emphasis today again is how to incentivize or encourage private owners to join us um, in installing green infrastructure. So the outline, um, and somebody will give me a heads up just so that I know when the, when the slides are visible to everyone, but at this point the outline today would be I will do a general sort of background and introduction. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about specific challenges that have to do with green infrastructure implementation. Um, Stacey, then, I've, I've pulled up the screen, so I've got control right now. Go ahead. Okay, good. So I'm on the second slide, Gwen, which is the outline. Yes. Um, okay, and then we will talk about an overview of the finance options, and we'll focus, however, on credits. Um, and the bulk of the, the real meat of the webinar today is going to be centered around these case studies. So you'll see we have Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, uh, the District of Columbia, Durham, North Carolina, and then the last one we'll mention pretty briefly is Ramsey, Washington, Metro Watershed District in Minnesota. So we have quite a spread across the country, but we made sure to have at least one example from the southeast area where most of you um, would find most relevant. Okay, so a little word on the Environmental Finance Center. As Gwen mentioned, we are based at the School of Government at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And we try to address the how do you pay for it question. So in this case, um, how do you pay for an environmental project like green infrastructure on private property? Um, but you can see sort of our mission vision statement there um, on your screen as well. So again, in terms of background, um, I call these next series of slides, and Gwen is going to have to do some clicking here, because the first, the first one just has the first one block that says uh, evolution of water quality management in the U.S. And we started off, and we can put times on these different boxes that you'll see flashing across your screen here. We can put timelines on them, but basically we started off in the country looking at water quality from the perspective of point sources. So the focus was wastewater treatment plants, factory outfalls, that kind of thing. And then the next box, which would probably require um, a click here, um, we are looking at examples like detention ponds um, and constructed wetlands. So then we've, we kind of evolved to um, put most of our resources into non-point source pollution. And then the next box um, will show the non-point source pollution again, but on a smaller, more distributed scale. And examples here would be rain gardens, permeable pavements, cisterns, that kind of thing. And that's where the emphasis is on today's webinar. Now, the challenge here, you know, and we say that if we, if we click again, we'll see that um, this is an evolution, and it's sort, of, of, it's sort of like a progress line. However, we don't want to stop looking at point sources. So it's, think of this more as layers. And then the other thing that just popped up here is that in some ways, with green infrastructure at least, even though there's some sort of an evolution that one can outline, it's kind of the old becoming new because this picture here is of a cistern that I took um, uh, from a beach in Trinidad and Tobago, and it is from the 1980s, well, sorry, the 1890s. Um, and you can't read that green plaque there, um, but it says that it was, you know, the cistern was used to capture water in the days when coffee and cocoa were, were very profitable. So, and for green infrastructure, it does make sense to sort of come back to quote unquote older technology um, because we are trying to mimic natural processes. So even though there seems to be an evolution, we do want to keep the original things like point source management. Um, and we're seeing this interesting um, sort of going back to some of the older technologies that we had. Um, the next slide will show you that not all green infrastructure, um, or at least water cisterns, look quite like that old concrete cracked one that I showed on the previous slide. Um, these cisterns here are from um, the North Carolina Botanical Gardens, and they were installed just a, a few years ago. Um, and the, the main point of this slide is to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of looking at a definition from EPA about what green infrastructure is. So they define it as an array of products, technologies, and practices that use natural systems or engineered systems that mimic natural processes um, to enhance overall environmental quality and provide utility services. All right, and our next slide is going to show us um, some of just kind of giving an overview of some of the challenges. So green infrastructure 
best management practices are by nature scattered across a jurisdiction because the goal is to treat the rain as close to possible as close as possible to where it falls. So they are by nature scattered across a jurisdiction. Um, and that scattered nature makes installation and operation and maintenance a little bit more difficult since the, since the sites are all over the place. In many cases, cities and counties are installing green infrastructure on their own lands and buildings, on streets and sidewalks, parks and rooftops, for instance. However, an effective green infrastructure program will include many sites that are ideal for GI projects that are on private property. So getting, again, getting private landowners to take, on, take actions that would benefit the public overall is, is tough, and that's a little bit of a challenge um, that we hope that we can sort of address today. And that really leads to the need for credits and incentives, which is where we'll spend the bulk of our time today. The next slide shows um, that the fact is it doesn't seem like public funds will cover all the need for GI in the country. Um, this, this is a quote from a publication from 2012 by American Rivers. And they've found that $106 billion is the need um, for stormwater infrastructure um, for corrections and improvements. So again, it's making the case that we should involve um, private investment here. Since it's, it seems that there are not enough public funds available to handle all the stormwater needs in the country. Okay, so the next slide goes back to this concept of evolution, if you will, again. So just as the previous slide showed that the overall management approach to water quality has been evolving, the financing mechanisms for stormwater and water quality have also been evolving. So at first, um, point one here, you see that general tax revenue money was used to manage stormwater on public property. That was sort of the, the starting point. Then we started to see a suite of regulations that encourage projects on private property. Eventually, we saw impact fees and offset fees in cases like Jordan Lake in North Carolina, where developers were asked to pay a fee to mitigate the impact that their particular projects were having on water quality. Fourthly, we've been seeing the creation, the creation of independent stormwater utilities that are enterprise funds within a local government, which I think would resonate with a lot of you on the call today. Um, there are, by counts from Western Kentucky University, about 1,400 of these stormwater utilities now. Then we have rebate and cost share programs uh, as one of the finance areas that we're going to spend uh, a lot of time on, on the webinar today on. Here there's some incentive by the government to encourage private landowners to install uh, water quality BMPs on their own property. The fifth one. Um, the sixth one, sorry, the fees, we, we are seeing that the, it sort of ties, so number six sort of ties numbers five and four together, in that these fees are increasing to a level that commercial entities are paying attention to the incentives because they now make financial sense. Uh, loans will cover a little bit more in the Philadelphia example that we'll cover. Um, tax incentives is, is one that we'll also provide more details on again. Uh, in the case studies that you'll be hearing. And then number nine, credit trading is important, and it's definitely a growing area. Today we'll only mention it briefly, um, but you'll have to come to the pre-conference event at the workshop in October in Charleston to hear more about that one. And then lastly, we have on here the idea that green infrastructure projects um, could be funded by a mechanism similar to property assessed clean energy um, is another area that we've done a lot of work on at the EFC, and we see huge potential there, but we're not going to spend um, too much time on that one today. And then uh, the next slide is looking at a survey from Black & Beach that they conducted in 2012. Um, it was done online. Um, we're not sure how many utilities it was sent to, but it, they received responses from 67 utilities from 19 different states. Um, when we think of 1,400 utilities across the country, we know that this is sort of a small sample size, but uh, the, the results are interesting to look at. Um, and the question was, does your utility offer any of the following incentive programs? So 68% of the respondents says no, none of the, I guess in this case, below. Um, but some do offer low interest loans and BMP installation cost rebates and that kind of thing. So going further into this area of stormwater credits, um, what is the first thing you think of when you hear stormwater fee? Uh, in your position, where, you sit, where you're sitting right now, does it sound like an unfair disguised tax? Um, is it an essential method of allocating stormwater costs? 
Is it a device for encouraging private investments? Or do you feel like this is too overwhelming, it's time to look for a new job? Um, so what kind of reactions come to your mind? And we're not going to include this as an actual poll, but just, just something to frame your thoughts right now and see where, where your perspective may lie when it comes to this topic. All right, so looking at uh, continuing here, credit or discount on stormwater utility fees. Again, let's just make sure that we define this and that we all have the same image in our, in our heads. So a credit or discount on a stormwater utility fee is a reduction in usually the monthly fee due to the installation of certain best management practices on the property. The benefits are, um, are several. Uh, one of them is it allows the rate payer to control and reduce their service fee. Um, if you wanted to reduce your water bill, you can use less water. You can in, install low flow fixtures at your house, for instance, and therefore your water bill should go down. Um, and this is also the same concept here. It's allowing the stormwater fee payer to control how much they pay for that fee to an extent. Um, also, it improves the legality of a stormwater utility fee, and that's really important, especially in places like like Georgia. We've seen a lot of cases come up across the country um, where stormwater utility fee was, was challenged because it didn't have a credit um, program or a discount program. And then it also encourages private property owner participation in both water quality and flood relief improvements. Um, it reduces public expenditures on the stormwater management program because, again, the private um, the private property owner is installing some of these BMPs and taking some of the fiscal responsibility away from the local government. The next slide is looking at two different studies, very different scales. So the, the chart on the left is showing um, the results of a 2012 Georgia stormwater survey that the Environmental Finance Center, we did um, at the state level. And we found that um, about 70%, so 69% of the 54 utilities that we surveyed. And we, we really contacted all of, the, all of the stormwater utilities in the state of Georgia. So it was very comprehensive. And about 70% of them did have some sort of a stormwater credit program. Um, the other chart is from the National Black and Beach um, survey that I described uh, a minute ago. And their results were sort of flipped. So Nationally, it seems like uh, stormwater credit programs are not as popular as, as they have been in the southeast. So this is, you know, we, could we can take this with a pinch of salt since the survey size was sort of small. But it looks like maybe in the southeast we are ahead of the rest of the country, largely speaking, in terms of credit programs with our stormwater utilities. The next slide looks at credit program subscription rates. So this survey was done by CESWA in 2013, um, and it covered uh, the southeast, so several states in the southeast. And the question specifically that CESWA asked was, of the total number of stormwater utility accounts, how many receive credit? It was a tough one to make any very strong statements about. Um, but if we look at a very conservative interpretation of the results that CESWA received, it seemed like anywhere from 0 0.03 to uh, 0.37% of the accounts take advantage of credit programs. And perhaps, you know, this, the take-home message from this slide probably is this is a great area for further study. We can't make um, too many huge conclusions here, but it does seem like there could be an increase in the subscription rates uh, for these programs. So that's, that's a, like I said, an area for further study. And perhaps a better question to ask in the future, or a more direct question would be, what percentage of general stormwater revenues um, is the utility kind of giving away in credit or quote unquote losing because of their credit programs? Maybe that would be more effective of a question to ask. But again, we can work on the subscription rates of these programs, it seems. At this point, um, before I go into the Philadelphia case study, I wanted to see if we had any particular questions or comments. So I know so far we've just kind of covered some general concepts. Um, but if you had questions so far, please go ahead and, and chat them, um, put them in the chat message area of the, of the software. But more, partic more, more importantly, perhaps, um, share your comments there. If you have a practice that has been really successful at your utility in terms of encouraging um, private 
property owners to install BMPs on their own lands. Please um, tell us about that, and we will we'll try to address those as we, as we go through, or at least at the end. So the case studies here are really at the heart of the presentation, so I don't expect too many sort of questions on, on that part of this yet, but we know that you all all have really successful um, programs of your own. So if you want to put a comment in there, we will try to, to fold that in or consider it as we move ahead. Stacy, this is Jeff. Um, we do have a, a few quick questions that I'll try to answer uh, before we move on, and we'll wait and see if we get any more, OK? Sure, go ahead, Jeff. Well, we had one, one question. It was a specific question, which I think you referred to. Um, do, do we know how many communities are, are charging stormwater utility fees across the country? And since it's such a localized and, and state level practice, we don't know definitively, but there is a group out of Kentucky that has done a, a, a very interesting survey where they basically relied on Googling uh, to try to identify how many utilities there are. And I think, uh, as you said, Stacy. They have found, last time they did that, about 1,400 across the country. So it's at least 1,400, probably a little bit more. Um, I know in like a place like North Carolina, we have done a detailed survey, and there are about 60 in the state. And that's in a place that has about 500 municipalities, if that helps. Um, we had another quick question that I'll, I'll mention before we move on. And it, and it was about um, how can we justify or how can what ways can a, a rain harvest or reuse be practical for private sites and we're not going to talk on this call a lot about the technical side of these measures but I did just want to clarify that when we say private sites we are including everything from a residential property to, to you know for example a mall or a large industrial site and there are certainly many examples across the country and across the southeast of some exciting uh, reuse, potable water, large-scale institutional size cisterns providing benefits to low scales. So I did want to clarify, when we say private property, we are thinking um, big as well as small. Um, and we do have some other questions that are coming in that I think we're going to leave some time for afterwards that deal, some of them may get answered in the case study. So why don't you start with the case studies, um, Stacy, and we'll, we'll get back to some of these questions in a minute. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you guys for putting some comments in there. That really um, helps us as presenters to make this a little bit more interactive and address. This is a big topic, so we'll try to focus on the types of comments that you are sending us. That's really helpful. OK, so jumping into the case studies here, uh, we'll start with Philadelphia. Um, they launched in January of 2012 a program called the Stormwater Management Incentives Program. Um, there's a grant component to it um, and a loan component, as you'll see as we move through. But again, the idea here was to be a catalyst for transforming large commercial impervious properties that generate high volumes of stormwater runoff um, and sort of put burden on the city's sewer systems and waterways. They're trying to incentivize those folks to maintain, build and maintain green stormwater management practices on their own property. So um, the next slide shows the, what, we, what we call the suite of programs in, in Philadelphia. So there are uh, four main ones that we highlighted here. So first, there's a grant component of the incentive program. There's also a loan component. And then the stormwater management credit is something that's um, still taking off. They have, that's not as developed as some of the other areas. And there is a green roof tax credit as well. If we look at the grant program first on the, on the next slide, um, the grant allows businesses, institutions, and other non-residential customers to reduce their stormwater charges by providing funding for the design and construction of these GI projects. Um, it's a joint effort uh, between the city, uh, the water department, and the Industrial Development Corporation. Uh, the project must be designed to capture at least the first inch of runoff, so that's one of their requirements. Um, they don't have a minimum or maximum grant amount request, but they kind of have a, a rule of thumb that uh, to be competitive, a project should, uh, if we're looking at $100,000 uh, per, per impervious acre 
or less, then it's then it's looked then it's looked upon favorably by the evaluators. Um, and they're looking at something like five million available through these grants. The next slide talks a little bit more about the grants as well. Um, after the BMP is installed, then there's the components of stormwater fee credits after the installation. So that's another part that they try to highlight. Um, also, the, the grantee must complete an economic opportunity plan with the City of Philadelphia's Office of Economic Opportunity. So this is, again, this is a joint effort, and they're one of the partners in it. So this is the, the part that benefits that agency. Um, and they won't pay for standard stormwater management requirements. Okay, so it's only for the, the portion that goes above requirements that they would consider funding with their grant funds. This is just a quote uh, from the Water Commissioner. Um, and maybe I'll highlight the last sentence. This is the best example of a public-private partnership. So P3s, or public-private partnerships, are receiving a lot of attention in, in terms of national infrastructure, especially when it comes to water, sewer, stormwater. Um, and so when you have water commissioners kind of getting on the bandwagon, as this guy seems to have done, it, it's a, it, it sends a, a the right message, I think. Um, the incentive loan program is is a partner of the grant program, and the loan amounts here can be anywhere from seventy five uh, thousand to one million. Uh, the interest rate here is pretty low, one percent fixed rate, and the term depends on the type of BMP that you've installed, um, up to a maximum of fifteen years. So it depends on the payback period based on the the installation that you've that you've done. Um, Participants are expected to put 10% um, equity co contribution in here, and there's a, there's a relatively small legal fee as well. So that's just some of the highlights of that program, or the, the programs in Philadelphia. What we really wanted to do is pretend that we were um, a business owner, so a commercial entity in Philadelphia, and what, what's, going to, what's going to be our thought process on signing on to a program like this or not. So we, we decided that we are a hypothetical parking lot um, commercial customer. Uh, we have 20,000 square feet of impervious area that we're dealing with. Um, when we install these BMPs, they retain 10,362 gallons, and that the installation cost was 50,000, and we thought O&M would be anywhere between one and $3,000 per year. So what we found is that for such a customer, if that customer did exist, their current stormwater mon monthly fee would be $204.43. Um, the installation cost, and you know, I have to say that you'll see at the end we give some credit to the utilities that um, the, the program managers for these. They were very um, interactive. We sent them our analyses and our hypothetical situation, and they, they really responded and kind of tweaked it for us. So in this case, um, Philly would only fund 38000 through the grant program of the installation, and the parking lot owner would pay 12000 Feasibly, they'd probably use the, 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 the loan program here to fund that 12000 But we didn't make any assumptions on that, on that front. So they, once they put this BMP in, their new fee after the credits would be $72.95. So the annual avoided fee cost um, would be $1,578 per year. And so that's, we, again, we tried to put on the hat of a potential customer saying, hey, am I going to do this or not? Um, and it's a lot for them to work through. Um, but in this case, you can see some of the results, that some of the number crunching they may have done. I wanted to make a little plug, um, again, pretending to be a commercial entity trying to navigate all these different programs and models. It's really nice to find an Excel model like this one from Philadelphia. Um, that you can put your numbers into, and it, it does a lot of the hard work for you. So actually, we found one on the DC website as well. Um, so if you don't have something like this, and you are having complaints from some of your potential commercial customers, um, this might be a good tool to help incentivize or help, help break down how the credit program works. Just giving a plug that we recommend these kinds of spreadsheet tools. Um, there's also a green roof tax credit that we wanted to mention. Uh, we didn't apply it to our parking lot example because we pretended that this parking lot had no, no roof. But if it did, the green roof must cover at least 50% of the building in order to qualify for the tax credit. And it provides the City of Philadelphia tax credit of 25% of the installation cost, uh, up to $100,000 per building. So we wanted to highlight that program as well. 
And at this point, I will switch it to Jeff. Um, he is going to go into the District of Columbia case study. Thank you, Stacy. And we did have a few questions come in as you were talking. One, one of them relates as much to the District of Columbia example as the, um, as the Philadelphia example. And I think one of the first questions is, where do you get the money to do these types of grant programs and rebate programs? And we don't have all the exact details for either D.C. or Philadelphia, but I, in talking to them and watching the evolution over the last few years, um, early on, there was some experimentation with some grant funds. There were some foundation and federal funds that came in to do some pilot projects. But as these have evolved, um, they have been worked right into the finance structure of the utility. So uh, the plan is, moving forward, that um, many of the funds for these programs will come from the utility fees themselves. Um, so that is an important point. Um, that we do see across the, the country places that are trying to tap into foundations. There's some interesting uh, nonprofit partnerships that, that are going on in some cities where they will provide the subsidy. But really from a su su uh, sustainable standpoint, we are uh, looking at this as a tool that a utility itself would choose to fund. Um, so. Go to uh, Washington. I'm not going to go through all the examples here, particularly the ones that look somewhat like the Philadelphia programs. Um, I really want to focus on some of the characteristics of their overall incentive programs more than anything. Um, both the district and Philadelphia were somewhat early adopters or at least early promoters of these types of credit programs. We do see a lot of these credit programs and these grant and rebate programs on the books, but they're not um, publicized really as heavily as, as they seem to be in some other areas. So um, I, I urge folks to take a look at the district and the Philadelphia websites. Um, these are not small programs that are kind of in the corner under a rock somewhere. These are an essential part of their overall strategy, and they get a lot of press. Um, going, going to the specifics, um, and these are just a few of the programs in D.C. There's actually some that, that we're not talking about. Um, like Philadelphia, D.C. has a mix of, of straight rebate and grant programs as well as uh, credit programs. And they're also experimenting with some, some even more advanced programs like trading programs. Um, the first two programs that are on this screen, uh, the River Smart Homes and the River Smart Communities, are their brand for rebates. And they're very uh, comprehensive rebate programs that cover a wide variety of uh, best management practices. Everything from planting trees to rain gardens are covered in these two programs. Um, one is more of a focus on an individual resident, and the other is a focus on um, communities, homeowners associations, um, and then institutional things like schools. So that's the River Smart Communities um, program. I want to talk a little bit more detail about some of these other programs. Um, the River Smart Rewards program is really the, the brand name for, uh, for the, the District Department of Environment Stormwater Fee Discount Program. So this is very similar to the program that Stacy mentioned. Um, DC is a very interesting um, stormwater program because there's actually two stormwater fees. There's one that is covered by uh, and collected by the dis uh, District Department of the Environment, and there's one that's actually uh, used to pay for CSO issues for DC water. We're going to focus on the smaller of the two, which is the DDOE stormwater fee, um, which, um, which does have an integral part of that fee is the ability of a, a resident and a non-residential property owner to reduce what they pay. And uh, under this program, um, you can reduce up to 55% of your uh, stormwater fee for both non-residential families and residential. We will say for the residential, and we're not going to focus too much on that, is the residential program is a much 
um, tends to be a much smaller credit, uh, but there is a simplified application process, so it doesn't require a lot of field visits and engineering calculations. Both of these programs, in order to keep them active, need to be reapplied every uh, reapplied for every every three years. So I'm going to go through just like Stacy did and show an example of the DC program. Um, the DC fee, at least this part of the stormwater fee, is not quite as large as the Philadelphia fee, um, but it does have that sizable potential credit. And let's take the same general type of um, uh, property that Stacy mentioned. Uh, in this case, we'll look at 20,000 square feet. Um, DC makes it very easy for you um, to calculate credits and fees because an ERU, an equivalent residential unit in DC, happens to be 1,000 square feet. So thank you very much, uh, DC, for that. Um, so 20,000 square feet property is 20 ERUs. They would, uh, at the current rate of two six two dollars and sixty seven cents. That would be $53 would be your default bill if you had this type of property in DC. Again, using the same type of um, sample BMP that Stacy modeled, let's assume a, a BMP on site could retain 10,000 gallons. That's the equivalent of about half of a storm event, uh, a 1.2 inch storm event on this property. Um, when you do the math based on what they calculate um, a uh, ERU to generate as far as gallons, that's the equivalent of 14.6 ERUs worth of water that is being captured on site. Um, they will let you get a credit of 55% of that 14.6. So the math is fairly basic. Multiply 14 by 6 by 55 and you get 8.1 ERUs, that is a $21.63 credit um, every month. Um, the net cost then drops from $53 down to $31. So again, um, significant in terms of the percentage of what people are paying, um, but if you look at the absolute magnitude of this, um, of this credit, $260 a year, um, you do have to ask how much can you spend for $260 a year worth of savings. So that you know may be equivalent of a of a 10-year loan for $20,000. Um, in other words, you could go off and borrow $20,000, pay it back, and you'd probably end up in the uh, in the black. So, but a, a really big part of this is again how hard they promote it and that this is really branded as part of their program. This is a fairly new program, so we don't have really detailed subscription rates yet for it. Um, really briefly, I want to mention, because um, the folks we talked to are very excited about this option, um, they realize that there are more tools in the toolbox than just these credits and grants, and, and DC is committed to developing an actual tradable program for their district, for their region. And we're going to be following this closely. Um, this is just a, a quick summary of what they imagine it's going to look like. Um, again, it's not up and running really in a, in a robust way yet. But the idea is that if a, a private property does exceed um, what they have to through regulatory requirements, um, they're going to be able to keep track of how much extra they hold on site, and they'll actually be able to sell that or market that to someone else uh, in the district. So an interesting, an interesting tool that we're going to be tracking closely. Um, a few other really quick case studies just to, to, to round out the, the whole spectrum of different measures that we're seeing across the country going to go through these rather briefly, but they are they are interesting to take a look at. Um, Stacy mentioned the PACE program. For those of you in the energy field, that will be a well-known name. This is a model where a local government or a utility would go onto a private property and make a private improvement, say uh, going onto one of these commercial properties putting in a rain garden, putting in uh, impervious pavement, say, for $30,000. Uh, 
Um, and then they would attach that $30,000 as a property assessment onto the commercial property. The commercial property owner would pay off that assessment just like they would pay off an assessment for street lighting or assessment for sewer. So it's, a, it's an exciting model. Uh, we are not aware of anyone using it for stormwater uh, BMPs yet. If you're interested in talking about this model, please um, please follow up with us. But it is becoming a model for things like um, solar installations on uh, properties. Um, in some cases, green roofs uh, have been talked about as a as a potential for this type of program. Um, another really interesting model I'm going to talk to about is in my home city of Durham. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the merits of giving out grants, using public money to give out grants for private property uh, improvements. And I think Durham has a really clever way of going about the grant giving out business. Um, rather than setting a flat grant amount per BMP, which is really the, the way that um, DC and others um, have approached it, um, Durham wanted to see if they could measure the willingness of local um, residents and local businesses to at least allow people to uh, allow the city to construct these BMPs on their property. So not a little bit different than the model in, in D.C. or Philadelphia, but this program was set up so that if you were an individual family in Durham, you received in the mail um, basically an auction uh, request that said, how much would the city have to pay you, give you a grant, or pay you, uh, for you to do one of these private uh, practices on your property that would improve the public good of the city. And the idea was Durham had a grant to go out and do some experimental uh, rain gardens on residential properties, um, and they were going to have to dig up people's yards. They were going to take part of a person's private property, and they thought that people might want to be reimbursed for that. But rather than just say, we'll reimburse anyone that wants to participate in this program a set amount, they asked, tell us what you want, um, thinking that this would make their money go further. And it worked. Um, for this little demonstration project that they had, um, most people came in with zero bids. In other words, they said, come onto our property, build one of these rain gardens, uh, put a cistern in. Um, and we're not going to require you to give us anything. So it, this is just, a, it was a little pilot project, but it gives us hope that there are some ways of refining these grant programs. I'm hoping that someone takes this uh, approach and next time around goes in and goes into the negative range and says to individual property owners, how much would you pay us to come onto your property and build one of these measures? So it's something that we're tracking closely. Again, just an alternative way of giving out a, a subsidy. The other thing that we're going to mention, and one of the questions came up about, um, about districts, uh, is um, what happens if you really do have a, a reliable source of revenue, but most of your improvements that you need to do are on private property? And that's the case in the Ramsey-Washington Metro Watershed District where they have a really robust district. It's a tax-supported district in Minnesota. They have a really healthy budget, but most of their high-impact projects um, are on things like mall parking lots. So we, we tracked, and we were out there visiting with them, and we tracked one of their projects that we just wanted to highlight for you. Um, it's, at a, it's at one of the, uh, the big area malls, the Maplewood Mall, and you'll see a picture on your screen here. Um, they had a very ambitious project design that was going to have a major impact on the watershed. It was certainly beyond regulatory compliance. Um, the mall was grandfathered in and didn't have to do any of this. Um, it wasn't a case of the mall making a private investment. Um, the mall said that, that they weren't ready to spend a lot of money on these measures, but they were willing to sacrifice, and in some cases, make some significant financial sacrifice in terms of giving up a large number of parking spaces. Um, so for us, sometimes private participation 
is sacrifice as well as actually um, pulling money out of a pocketbook. So this is just another quick example where um, with that district fund, the district was willing to make a sizable investment on a private property, but the, the private property owner had to have full buy-in. It had to give uh, maintenance easements. It had to lose parking spots. Um, so again, it was a nice example of a public-private partnership. Um, with that, we wanted to spend the last 15 minutes going back to some of our questions. Uh, there's a, quite a few that have come in. Um, and I think at this point, if you give it just a second, we're going to pull up the questions and we'll, uh, we'll get to some of them. But please, um, again, if you have any questions about either the DC cases or the Philadelphia cases, go ahead and type them in. Um, and uh, if you just have a comment you want to share, we may have a, tie, a minute or two to read some of the, just the general, the general comments. So we did, just going down the list, um, a couple of the general comments that I think are worth noting from folks in the audience is there is some skepticism about this type of approach on residential properties versus non-residential properties. And we, we intentionally highlighted more of the non-residential uh, programs out there. As a group, we're tracking non-residential programs right now a little bit more actively than residential programs. Um, but we, we have seen many, uh, many programs that have been reluctant to offer these incentives on the, on the residential side. The places like DC that have done it, um, it's really getting back a little bit to Stacy's point. In some cases, it's a legal protection. They offer a very minor residential credit, not because they necessarily think they're going to have a huge impact on water quality, but in order to be able to give uh, some measure of control to bill payers. Um, so I think that is a pretty insightful comment. And um, it is, I think we are probably going to see more of these programs at least start out on the non-residential and institutional sector. Um, So we had a, a question that asked, um, what percentage of customers actually apply for the credits? Um, and I don't know, Stacy, if you want to talk a little, just uh, talk a little bit more about that Black and Beach answer. Um, yeah. Well, that. yeah. One of the before I go to the Black and Beach study, I, you know, we, we mentioned Philly and DC, and I will say that um, the DC program coordinator told me that if she had three hands, she could count how many non-residential customers have applied to their credit program. Um, but they feel that um, things like the credit trading is really going to um, improve that number, or increase the number, I should say. And then also, um, they are looking at making their application process a little bit more simplified uh, for certain types of projects, and they expect that when that rolls out in a month or two, that that, that would increase the subscription rates as well. Um, Great. I, well, I think there, um, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that um, the Black and Beach uh, questionnaire or survey did cover a, uh, a couple different aspects of that. Um, and Jeff, did you say you wanted me to look into that a little bit? mention some of what they... Well, I think you just mentioned, I think we, especially for people that signed up late, um, mm -hmm. I think we, we do need to be really honest with this, that the, the application and the actual successful subscription to these programs seems to be very, very low as a percentage of customers. I, and, and I think the Black and Beach number, I don't recall exactly what it was, but it was, it was 2, 3 percent, something like that. Yeah, let me see if I can... Pull up or that might have been the, that might have been from our Georgia uh, survey. I, I stand corrected. I think that might have been from our Georgia survey. Well, while you're looking for that, um, I, I think a very related comment that someone has that I, I'm glad they mentioned was this question of business case. And the the caller or the the participant mentioned that if you don't look at the grant, 
in Philadelphia and you are looking for a payback just based on these credits, and I think you, both Stacy and I mentioned this, um, the hardcore single bottom line finances don't necessarily always make sense. In fact, they seem to us in the, in the, the credits that we've looked at across the, the country is it's tough to make a business case for some of these BMPs, particularly the really cost, costly ones. Um, I have tried to find a program where I could pay for a green roof based on their credit, uh, a stormwater fee, and uh, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough sell. And, and so somebody brought out that in Philadelphia it looked like it was going to be a payback of 15 or 20 years, and I think that's right. Uh, if you look at the numbers and you were trying to pay for these just based on stormwater fee credits alone, we tend to see fairly large paybacks. Um, I think the places that, that you know, the, the three hands applications that are coming into D.C., the places that are taking off as early adopters to these programs are people that have other reasons for, um, for, for, for turning their properties, quote, green. Um, you know, a lot of folks uh, want to have these rain gardens. They want to be more of a public uh, player in, in their community. So this is just that extra little incentive for kicking those folks forward. Um, I also think um, we are seeing in the southeast, at least in a few examples, those stormwater fees per ERU creeping up into some serious money. Um, once those finance, uh, excuse me, once those stormwater fees start to top $20 per ERU, which we haven't quite seen in, in the southeast, but we have seen that in the northwest of the country, you're going to see some of the economics change. Just like we've seen in the water field, when the price of water gets to a certain point, we're seeing a lot of investment in water efficiency. So uh, it's just uh, something that we're tracking. But I, I think it, it would be inaccurate for us to say that these credit programs alone are going to drive wholesale implementation of these issues. I think we're going to have a suite of policies that include outright credits and grants. It's going to include maybe low interest loans and regulations. And Jeff, I, this is Stacey, I'll just make a quick comment on that as well. Um, we did, on the slides that Jeff and I presented for Philadelphia and D.C., we mentioned operation and maintenance costs of this new installed BMP being in the range of one to 3000 We didn't really factor that into the calculations as well. And going back to the comment about making a business case, you would have to do that. Um, you would have to consider that you have an additional cost now or a new cost in terms of maintaining this structure that was put in. So. That's also an important factor. Okay, we're we're we're, um, we're getting some really great comments. I think we'll we'll be able to t deal with a few more of them. A couple of them uh, are basically suggestions for moving forward. I did want to mention that we want this to be a, a kind of a peer to peer uh, collective uh, program this morning. Um, a lot of discussions uh, about paying for stuff on private property is great. But what about paying for the stuff on public property? And maybe we need to have a seminar just on financing uh, infrastructure on public property. And we certainly would be open to that. And I know SESWA would be open to that. And we've looked at a lot of things uh, tapping into SRF programs, state revolving funds, um, other types of creative measures for, for especially debt financing for those. So um, I think that would be, would, would be a good suggestion. A couple of folks mentioned in the southeast that there is some excitement around stormwater credits. Um, Chattanooga is planning on open, uh, creating an open market for stormwater credits this December. So another another thing that we want to track. Maybe another another topic for a webinar moving uh, forward. A um, few other comments about the business case issue. Um, and, and again. Um, somebody just looking at the numbers and trying to make it work as a single bottom line uh, business case, and, and it doesn't, and we, we understand that. Um, there was a question that was really a technical question for the, um, the Minnesota example and the Maplewood question, how did the reduction of parking conflict with the parking codes, and how well did the different departments come together to allow this reduction? Um, 
we we asked that question in, in, in when we were out in Maplewood, out visiting um, in Minneapolis, um, and it was not a question for them. It was a large mall, and they were able to sacrifice the parking lots. It was uh, parking spots, but it has come up quite a bit um, in some of the retrofit finance work that we've looked at. And I think this is really a question for everybody out there: is what um, what steps are you taking? Uh, within a city government to make sure that if the stormwater utility offers an incentive for um, digging up a parking lot, is the planning uh, is the planning department on board? Um, and we have seen that um, as part of a holistic approach. Um, one of the ways that we have seen people encourage investment that has nothing to do with expenditures are by offering things like parking density. Um, increase, uh, excuse me, parking, re relaxing parking standards for certain DMPs. So have, uh, I'm trying to remember who that is right now, and I'm not, I'm not remembering it, but we have at least seen on a couple occasions places that would allow fewer parking spots for a commercial entity if they um, had a green roof or if they had something um, that was going to the public good in other ways. So great, great insightful comments. Um, there are some just questions about what are the best online resources for city planners to quickly browse financing case studies and, and models. Um, this is a, a good opportunity for us to plug a little bit some research that we are doing with EPA and several communities. Um, Stacy is taking the lead on a catalog of green infrastructure financing resources, everything from case studies to financing guides that is going to be out on our website um, shortly. So um, this is certainly something that we could we could make available to SESWA uh, and send out. It's actually up. I stand corrected. So for, for uh, at least one of the online resources is um, efc.unc.edu. Um, EPA has an excellent green infrastructure focus these days, um, and you will be able to spend many hours on the, um, if you just Google in green infrastructure at EPA. As, as far as, um, there are certainly regional leaders in the southeast, but again, I, um, I do want to give a little bit of hats off to Philadelphia and D.C. They, they have been some, some, some pretty important early adopters. Um, Cincinnati as well. Um, Cincinnati, Ohio, especially in the green roof area, has some really exciting case studies. So those are all resources that if people are kind of jotting down uh, websites to take a look at, um, I suggest those. Um, and Jeff, if, if I may add something on, on the sure. catalog really quickly. So the catalog we sent out to several listeners about a month or two ago. Um, asking folks to give us comments on the draft version of the catalog, and we have gotten a lot of comments that we're still working through and sort of revising that. So there's a draft version to look at, but please, we've, we, we're remodeling it quite a bit. So if you have comments on the draft, you guys on the call today, even though the deadline has technically passed, you can still um, send us those comments, and we'll try to incorporate yours as well. But then look back in the next week or two for the sort of final version of that catalog. But it does, like Jeff described, list it's a short summary, it's a table listing the, the resources that we have found to be m most useful when it comes to how do you pay for these projects, so the finance piece of it. Um, whereas there are a lot of publications on green infrastructure in general right now, we try to narrow in on the finance piece. Okay, thank you. Thank you both very much. Jeff, are we able to get to all of the questions, or were there some left unanswered? Uh, there, there are a few, there are a few, um, there are a few really just, again, insightful questions that what we will do, we'll offer up Gwen um, answering some of the ones that we didn't get to in a short memo, and you can send that out to all of the um, participants. Um, okay. There's okay. only one, one clarification question is when I was saying $20 per ERU as sort of a, a bellwether, that is $20 a month per ERU, which we're starting to see approach in the Northwest. I don't think anyone in the Southeast is close to $20 per ERU per month. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, Gwen. Okay. Well, I, as we wrap up the webinar, I'd like to thank the presenters for their time and support in helping us to bring this training event to you. 
Um, and I'd especially like to thank um, our sponsors, which is um, the City of Stewart and the Sanitation District Number One, whose sponsorship allowed us to bring this webinar to you free of charge. And remember to register for the annual conference um, set for October 8th through 10th in Charleston, South Carolina. You can register online right now. Um, as I, I mentioned before, a link to today's recording uh, for the webinar will be emailed to you and also be available on the webinar page. And also the PowerPoint slides will be on the uh, webinar page of the SESWA website. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining us.